Lord, we thank you for bringing us into this 10 o'clock hour this morning, and I welcome those of you that are joining in on the live stream today. I truly want to seize this opportunity today to pursue. I want us to know why we're here. We're here to pursue the knowledge of the Word of God and to develop our faith in the Word of God. I want to take this opportunity because I understand that the more knowledge of the Word and the stronger and greater your faith, it offers us the impunity and the safe passage to an eternity in heaven. I am so delighted this morning to uh, be here and to be in the presence of God most importantly. I'm so delighted that, uh, uh, that you have allowed me to be a part of your day through the word of God. I'm so delighted and I'm pleased to be afforded such an opportunity this morning to be in the presence of God and to study his word. So I consider it an honor and a privilege, one way or the other, to the empowerment by the word of God together, that we can join together and empower each other in the word of God. As always, as I say all the time, and God knows how much I mean this, it is with the greatest humility and the deference to the Holy Spirit that as the caretaker of his house, I submit myself to his will. You know, we had quite an interesting week all week this week, but I began to process some things and ask God for some direction and ask God for some healing in my own spirit and in the spirit of those around us. And I truly sought the Lord in depth to, to talk to me at a different level. You know, sometimes we want God to talk to us and I don't know, what is your expectation? Is there a voice coming through the ceiling or something? And it really doesn't work that way. What I realize is that sometimes it's difficult to manifest your thought life into action. It's common to assume that if we didn't accomplish something today that we can get to it tomorrow. Lots of things I'm sure you have uh, uh, didn't do on your check-off list and you say, I'll get to that tomorrow. But sometimes that doesn't always work out, does it? Truth be told, sometimes if you miss the moment, tomorrow may be too late. I found that happens quite a bit. Not everything can be postponed for tomorrow. But I want to invite you this morning to join and journey with me in the book of Daniel, the 11th chapter. Daniel, the 11th chapter, I want to work out of that this morning to, 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 to give us some perspective, to, to give us some some, some some concept and some context um, in, 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 in what our life is and what our expectation ought to be. So if you don't mind, journey with me to the book of uh, uh, Daniel, the 11th chapter. I'll give you a minute to get there. Um, and I want to just pull one verse, but I want to capture a lot more of it because... Uh, 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 it, it, it's one of the most, uh, uh, you know, awesome books in the Bible as I began to study it, as it uh, was uh, uh, applicable to some live, real-time issues that I was dealing with. And I recognized how much the Word, or how much value is in the Word of God. Beloved, listen. Don't take the Bible for granted. The Bible has everything that you go through in life 
I don't care what your status, what your situation, where you are, where you, uh, what, what the color of your skin is. I don't care what it is, but the Bible gives us value to every aspect and every portion of one's life. Um, not all at the same time, on the same level, on the same, on the same field. Everyone at their different pace and different level, but it does hold the value to our life. So if you're there with me, um, in, uh, Daniel the 11 chapter, I just want to read for you verse uh, 32. And I want to share this message with you. Verse 32 of the 11 chapter of Daniel. And it reads, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And my concentration is going to be in that B portion of the, of the text. The people that know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. I'm inspired by the topic this morning. I know somebody. Look somebody in the eye and tell them, I know somebody. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for this opportunity to share your word and to study your word and to connect with your people of God. I pray, Father, that each and every one that's uh, 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 engaged with this uh, message right now would be blessed. Will be, uh, will be edified and empowered. I pray that they would receive the word of God this morning and that it will ex uh, explode in their spirit and that it will manifest in their hearts and it will cause them to be more than the conqueror. Today I pray that the word will build them up and lift them up and build their faith this morning and strengthen them as they come closer and draw closer to you and begin to know you they shall become strong and they shall do great works. I thank you, Lord, for this investment this morning that you have placed in me. And I humble myself before you, God, and I ask that you use me, decrease self, and increase your anointing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen if you're with me. I submit this morning that the believer's single greatest asset is knowing God. Uh, be mindful that there's a difference in knowing God and knowing about God. Make no mistake about it. The value of the difference between knowing God and knowing about God could result in life and death. Simply put, knowing about someone means having knowledge of certain facts about them. When you know about somebody, you have information that is uh, 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 about that person. You have heard about them. You have, have dealt with them. You may have heard through someone else about them, but you don't really know them. Jesus is the most known person across the globe. Everybody at some point in time, sinner, save uh, the Pope, everybody has heard about Jesus, about the works of Jesus, about the, the plans of the Lord. And while many have heard about him and know a lot about him, Sadly, not enough know him intimately. Jesus himself said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Beloved sons and daughters, 
you would be surprised. You would be stunned if you really had a clear knowledge and understanding of how many people come to church on a Sunday who haven't settled their differences between their culpabilities and God's love and forgiveness. You will be surprised how many people are still wrestling with issues while they're in the church. And I said, God, but how could that be when all these people come to church, they hear the word of God, they travel here, they go there, they, they do all these things, they, they have their Bibles, they go to Bible study, they do this, they do that. How is it that their culpabilities can't be reconciled with God's love and forgiveness? And God showed me, he says, there's a significant percentage of people who attend church services but have not allowed themselves to become the church. Oh, um, just allow me to teach a little bit this morning because I really want you to absorb this in your spirit today because I, 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 I am to the point, beloved children of God, here, there, and everywhere, wherever you are, that this thing that we call church and do church and what we are engaged with, this is serious business. This is not just an act of, of, of familiarity. This is not just a going here, going there, participation. No, 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 no. You don't get to heaven for participation. The significant percentage, God said, he says, son, listen, I'm going to show it to you. He said, check out the church. And he started to reveal some things to me. He said, there's a great bunch of people in church who are in the body of Christ, who are coming to church every Sunday. They attend the services. They sing in the choir. They participate in very key aspects and core groups in the church. But they have not allowed themselves to become the church. They have not allowed God to dwell in them whereby God is exhibited through their actions. And he said the reason for that is mainly because they haven't fully accepted the terms that the battle is not theirs, but it's the Lord's. I'm not knocking you down this morning. I want to build you up. God says until you take your hand off of some of the issues of your life, you are not allowing yourself to become the church. Because the church should not engage, and that's I'm talking about the, 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 the church in you, should not engage in fighting these petty battles, for the battle is the Lord's. And so God wants you, the church, to be his instrument, wherein he can, he can use you so that somebody can know him through you. He says, too many people haven't resolved and settled in their spirit the reality that they should wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He says too many people are taking things in their own hands and not understanding that they need to lean on God and not on their own understanding. The reality is, God showed me, that a lot of folk are still struggling with Philippians 12 and 1 which states... For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, it's difficult for one to validate God's forgiveness and love. I, 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 I hope you're listening intently this morning, because this is going to bless your heart. I, 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 it's difficult to validate God's forgiveness and love if you can't forgive and love yourself. If you can't put away the past knowing that God has absorbed and forgiven your sins and you are still walking around with the stuff in you, you cannot validate God in you. Wow. I want to further submit to you that there are many who don't believe that they deserve God's love because of their past. There are so many people that are so that have had, I included by the way, who have had such a checkered past, 
who have gone through some things in their in, in their childhood and 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 have acted in some ways way out of proportion and 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 and, and to the point that sometimes people just can't even believe that God can accept you based on your past. They're convicted and condemned by themselves by their guilt. There are many people who have convicted and condemned themselves by the guilt of their past and they can't imagine being worthy of God's promises. So now they're conflicted between knowing God and knowing about God because they don't feel worthy to stand in the presence of God knowing that God will forgive me because they haven't forgiven themselves. They don't believe that God can forgive them because they are not seeing a God. You know, it's not like you, you, you do something and you walk up to someone and you, with all your emotions and everything, you look them in the eye and square in the face and you apologize profusely for what you've done and they may smile back and say, okay, it's all right, I understand. But when you're looking for forgiveness from God, but you're not seeing him all you're knowing is you stand up at the altars and you say lord i'm I, i'm here to be delivered and you walk away that forgiveness it does not impress upon your heart that as as much because you haven't seen god eye to eye and so you have difficulty processing the issue that your sins have been washed away Somebody showed you a picture of Jesus on the cross. You see it all over Resurrection Sunday. And that's the closest eyeball witness that you get. So after that picture fades away from your memory, you're wrestling with the fact that the guilt which has stained your heart uh, is still there. But you've got to be able to put aside that guilt uh, knowing that God has uh, washed your sins away and wiped your sins away and he has pardoned you, blotted out your transgressions and pardoned your sins and he has made you whole and he has taken the sins and he took it to the cross. You got to get to that point. This is why God says there's so many in the church that have not become the church. So, what God began to show me here was that fulfilled prophecies are proof that God is sovereign. Fulfilled prophecies confirm the sovereignty of God. Daniel 11 is one of the most extensive accounts of detailed fulfilled prophecy. And now understand that these details may be boring to those who don't like the study of biblical history, but that's where I'm going down this morning. Because it's important for every believer that they should gain at least a basic knowledge of God's divine prediction since its fulfillment is confirmation that our God is in control. You see, because we can see God for God to tell us stuff, we got to see the promises of God manifest in our life so that we can understand that God is in control. We can see the manifestations of the things that God has said so that we can believe that God is in control. Every believer must come to terms with that, otherwise you are just walking around in church, going through the motions every Sunday, sing, dance, praise, worship, pray, go home, listen to the message, whatever, in whatever order. You see, fulfilled prophecies serves as proof that he still has our future in his hands and he still will fulfill the promises that he made to us which we haven't seen the manifestation of yet. So it includes those which concern you. 
fulfill prophecies mean that God has spoken some things over our lives down through the years and is still speaking over our lives and not every Sunday just after we finish minister everything we say just comes to pass when you go home sometimes it may take a week it may take a day it may take a year it, 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 let me put it in perspective it takes on with until God decides that's the appointed time so the thing is, you're getting the word, you're getting the prophetic information, you're getting the promises, and that's what you take with you, and you wait on the Lord and be of good courage. When, we, when people in the world say things to you, sometimes it's not right there and then it comes together. If you fill out an application for a mortgage loan, it doesn't come together the right day the same day it goes through a process uh, and you wait on it in expectation of a good response and you wait till they process your papers and till they check this information and check that information and then figure it out and tell you what it is well the word of the lord acts in the same type of principle that not every prophecy you get today or promise you get today or word you get today will immediately take its root and manifestation in your spirit today but it may be promised to you and God will decide the timing of the promise the purpose of the promise and when the promise shall be effected so now Daniel 10 begins to set the stage for chapter 11 Daniel 10 begins to lay the framework concerning Daniel's vision that he had roughly five centuries before the birth of Jesus. The vision troubled him so much that the Bible says he began to fast and pray. He began to fast and praying and he's wanting to know what's going on because this is so troubling and confusing to him. And the Bible says 21 days later, three weeks later, he had a visit from an angel. The angel came and reported to Daniel and said, do not fear. The very first day that you set your heart to understand and you humbled yourself before the Lord, the word of God was heard from your cry and God responded. You see, uh, beloved, I want you to understand, uh, sometimes you pray in the same prayer repeatedly over and over and over and over and over and over, six months into the, 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 the desire, you pray in the same prayer over and over and over and over, God heard you the first time. If you didn't see the answer, give God praise and thank him for the expected answer. Keep on praying the same prayer over. It's not going to make the it's not going to get it to you any faster. It's not going to change the dynamic of what God is going to do. You're going to get what you what God wants you to get. God heard you the first time. Now it's just for you to believe. So the angel said to Daniel, "The minute you dropped on your knees and the the second you began to pray and your heart was fixed in the right manner and you be." began to be humble before God, not with an attitude or not with, I need this now. But you were humble before God and you were waiting on the Lord because you understood that it was God who needed to answer this. The angel said, the minute you were before God, your words were heard. He said, but what really happened is this. The prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. I had your word for you and I was coming to you with it. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia didn't want you to get the word. So he fought me for 21 days. And it's not until God sent the archangel Michael, one of the chief princes, and he says, Go and help him because he is holding up the... Oh God help me today. Ah, I'll read the priest's message right here. He's holding up the word that has to get to Daniel. 
And the angel said, and, 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 and Michael came and he began to help me. And so then while Michael took on the battle for me, I was released. So now here I am to tell you the meaning of the dream which you had and what will happen to the people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. September 5th. All of these are the days yet to come. The word was stuck en route to Daniel because an angel was carrying it who was confronted by opposition. You see, sometimes your word is on the way. But because you can't wait, you get up off your knees and you stop the praise and you stop the worship because you think God ain't acting on your response. But sometimes the word is on the way and maybe your word is caught up in a battle or just maybe your word ain't released the manifestation point yet. So sometimes this is why this text, the scripture says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. You know, at first, when you get to Daniel 11 at the beginning of the text, at the beginning of the, of the book, it seems sort of confusing, maybe even boring to some. And I, at, 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 at times before I confessed, looked at, text, uh, looked at the text, and I'm like, man, I don't know about this, man. This is just a lot of stuff. But as I heard it differently from God, and as God began to minister it in my spirit, I was so excited of the word of God. But in 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 in, in for the brevity of preaching this morning and with the absence of historical commentary or aid I can't get into every detail of every of every uh, scripture that is recorded there so I want to just sort of like summarize it for you like this if you give me the opportunity early in the chapter Daniel is given a vision the future of the Persian Empire Daniel sees in the vision some things that are going to take place, but he didn't understand what it meant and what is it to me and how is this going down. He is told about the Greek empire of Alexander the Great. Then for a majority of the, 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 the book, between roughly the third verse and the 35th verse, we are explained of some extended series of conflicts between Egypt and Syria with Israel caught in the middle. You see, from since back then, this is where there was conflict taking place and Israel was the victim. The results culminated in the rise of a terrible, horrible man, a dictator named Antiochus, against whom Israel would eventually rebel. In the latter part of the book of Daniel, around about the 36th verse towards the end, the focus shifts from Antiochus to the final world dictator, the Antichrist. Oh God, I can hear some people, Lord, I don't know if I can deal with this. Deal with it, hold on, just deal with it with me. Because it ties back to you today. So the Bible begins to explain through this vision and through Daniel's dream and interpretation, and it describes the unfolding battles of the Great Tribulation period, which led up to the annihilation of Antichrist. So as I petitioned God to give me some relevant context from this text, I'm praying, I'm like, God, show me how this is dealing with us today. Your people need some help, God, because we are caught in a quagmire of circumstances and conditions, and we are like Israel, my God help me this morning. We are like the Israel to the Egypt and the Syria because the battles are being fought, 
and we the people of God, you and I, are caught in the quagmire and in the crossfire and we are being abused and misused and we are being tormented and persecuted and we are going through some things in our life that we don't understand because the battle is going on on this side and on that side and we are caught in the middle. So I said, God give me some context of this text uh, to apply it to, G to, to, to Gerald and to Wendy and to all of us today so we can understand how do we survive the battles. My focus was drawn to a couple of things. The angel gave Daniel a clearer understanding of what would occur in the future. And throughout this chapter, what I began to see was the vital manifestations of all what was being listed in the chapter. Let me give you a for example. The very book of Daniel is referred to as God's book of truth. And in this chapter begins to speak. Watch this, watch this. As I went through this chapter and I went through it and I began to dig verse by verse, which I'm not going to put you through this morning, but I'm going to surmise it for you and help you to understand. In this chapter, the 11th chapter of Daniel, it began to show through the predictive revelation of God that therein was the birth of Islam. In this chapter, it also illustrated and opened up the, the, the fact that Islam was split. This chapter also reveals and showed the Shiites was taking control of the south side and the Mongols took control of the north side. It begins to bear some credence in this chapter to where the British and the French split the Middle East international boundaries and assigned leaders this is this is some history but it will help you understand something this chapter also predicts the Islamic revolution and it also shows America's role in the Middle East there are predictions in this chapter of the ISIS invasion of Iraq and the, de the declaration of the caliphate, as well as the Saudis' war in Yemen. This chapter, as we read it, and then we dig into it, and the meaning of it, and the history of it, showed a whole lot of current world events, and post-rapture events. You see, this chapter is speaking to our life, as it has unfolded over the past decades or two, and it is speaking to our life in a post-rapture situation as we head into some really uncharted war, un ununderstood times that we are living in right now. But what captivated me and made a huge impression in my spirit, what God impressed upon my heart so much out of this chapter was was the concern for the decline of the church. My God, help me now. You see, currently we live in a society which is plagued by an assortment of ungodliness. And we are staring down a life that no longer is predicated upon the fear of God. We are not seeing and, 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 and witnessing the fear of God anymore around us because uh, people has moved God out just about everything. It's out of the school, it's out of the, it, it, I, well, let me go into that, that yet. It, it has brought us to a point that life is no longer predicated upon the fear of God. It is no longer predicated upon the moral and ethical standards which are founded upon the word of God. We are we have begun to navigate behavioral traits which are defining destruction of our generations. Our country has become less religious. Our millennials aren't desiring any religious passion. Rather, they are shying away from it. Our 
almost adults, those that are in their teenage years and almost getting to adulthood, find that the church is defined by hypocrisy. They don't see the church as a place of a sacred place and, and with respect and reverence anymore. They see it as a place of hypocrisy. Research has revealed that a significant percentage of people believe that they can find their way through life without the church, while others contend that God is not even in the church. Some just see the church today as an elaborate building with multiple programs, feed the, feed the poor, do the this, do the that, programs. And they don't see the church as the church ought to be seen as the first responders to sin and salvation. Many don't see the church like that no more. The church is just a building that hosts a program for after school, a place where you can go get a meal uh, 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 or get some clothes, a place where you can just go in and out uh, with no obligation, no consequence, no anything, um, a place where you could go and say, I have no food, I need to be a, a meal, and you just go use the church back and forth, and God is saying the church has lost its position. Young people are looking at the church and looking at the hypocrisies of the leadership in churches and saying, are you serious? I am not going to that. Many have asked the question. Many have asked the question upon what is going on in the church. Why is the church so silent? Oh, I'm getting steamed up here. Why is the church so silent? Why are the voices which are supposed to represent God continue to be absent from all the chatter which shapes the mind and the lives of God's people? Why are God's people so quiet about all the things that are going on around us? Why are we caught in the middle of this Egyptian and Syrian war? And why are we just sitting here and being bombarded and being the victims of stuff that's going on in society and the church has been silent. George Barna, who is the founder of the Barna Research Group, revealed in a poll that he asked some pastors, he said, how do you know that the church is successful. And he says he was stunned and amazed at the answer because he said the universal answer across this group of pastors that he was talking to, the answer was, we you know the church is successful because of the attendance, because of the given, the amount of accounts receivable, the number of programs we have operating within the church, the amount of staff we have on, on, on hire, and the school footage of the church, the size of the building and all, the, this after school, the, 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 the K-12 to uh, uh, 12 and all the programs we have. He said, this is what was the consensus among these pastors, the, 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 this group that he was talking to. He says, they said, this is what makes a successful church based on these criteria. So in other words, here's what, here's what I got from there. In other words, if these are the goals to success, according to them, if these goals aren't met, which are like corporate goals in the world, it begins to speak of failure. So if we don't have a sizable attendance, if we don't have a, 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 a sizable income, if we don't have numerous programs, nor, or no, 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 some of the other things that are going on in some churches, if it's not a, a 40,000 square foot uh, uh, edifice, or, or, or they don't have all these things, then that means we are failing the community because we're not doing anything that is substantial and recognizable in the church. What does that say, Pastor? Glad you asked. It stands to reason then that Ephesians 4 and 11 is not the core success anymore. Ephesians 4 and 11 is not the core success anymore. And here's where you get to get this now. Here's where you got to tie this in. Yeah. But when church leaders, when church leaders, when, when you begin to hear the leaders of churches begin to refer to themselves with the business titles of a, a CEO and CFO and COO, you know, the, I, I'm the chief, uh, 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 the, the chief executive. 
executive officer and I'm the chief financial officer and I'm the chief operating officer. When you begin to hear them assert to themselves those titles and they're not in accordance with Ephesians 4 and 11, which is the fivefold ministry, which says in the word, and he gave himself and gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And why? And he gave them for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. Then you got to understand that there's a shift that has taken place. The church is no longer acting for the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body, because they don't have pastors anymore. They don't have teachers anymore. They don't have apostles and prophets and evangelists uh, because they are more concerned about uh, being the CFO, the CEO, or the COO. There's a shift. And I'm not saying this is going on in every church. Don't get me wrong now. And I'm not saying you can't identify yourself, pastor or apostle or bishop or, 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 or district elder or whatever you are, as a CFO. But what I'm saying is, the first responsibility that God has given us as leaders is to be the edify, for the edifying of the saints. Not just to build buildings, not just to expose and, and, and have a big edifice and fancy looking and big parking lots and fancy cars. All that is good. Or oh, listen to me. Clearly, all that is good. God's people ought to have the best. But God's people also have to be the most compassionate, the most concerning, the most, the most, the most caring people. Because the people that don't know God and I've only heard about God, uh, is looking for somebody to introduce them to God, uh, to show them a God uh, that they have only heard about. Uh, and if you know God, uh, and if you know the hierarchies, and if you know all the big shots and the big wheelers and dealers, uh, and if you know the people who hold the highest positions in the land, and you ain't trying to introduce me to them, then I will always remain knowing about them, but never know knowing them. Mm, mm, that's, where are you with this? God cautioned me that Daniel 11, between the third verse down through like the 35th, is playing out right before our very eyes in this right now season. There's an assault and an attack on Christianity. And we must not support it by being silent. We must not just stand by and let the world and let secularism run roughshod over the Christianity, the principles of God, the word of God, and the promises and the predictive prophecies of God. We must not just stand by silently while the enemy has his way. Brings me to the vital lesson of chapter of the chapter which is in verse 32. And the text says and the people who know their God who know their God Lord, if you rem uh, saints of God, if you remember anything again for the rest of this day service, just remember that B portion of the text. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. It teaches us that the knowledge of God, together with the strength which comes from God, will empower you to be the most powerful and enduring force against the evil you encounter in this world. You see, you ain't got to fight the battle, but you got to understand who you need to call when the battle shows up at your door. There are three powerful concepts which the writer showcases in this, in this one text. To know, know God. And you will be made strong. 
and you will do exploits. The people that know their God shall be shown. The scripture is a prophecy and it was well, and, and this prophecy was fulfilled. In the time of David, the Maccabeus, it was Maccabeus and a small group of men who were loyal to God, attacked and defeated the, the, the superior forces of Antiochus many times over. Antiochus was a brutal, horrible, wicked ruler. Ma, ma, the, 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 the Maccabees, which they later became known as, and a small little ragtag band of guys came up against this huge army with all their, their battle gear and everything. And they defeated them over and over and over. Before each battle, Maccabeus would encourage his men to willingly give their life to God. See, there's a strategy here, people of God, hear me. Their exploits became legendary. There is a, tr a truth here that which goes beyond the prophetic fulfillment of the Maccabees. I said it last week. I said it again. There's a significant difference in knowing God versus knowing about God. The book of John in the 17th chapter, Jesus said, and this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you have sent. Everyone but the fool know about God. It's only the fool who has said in his heart that there is no God. Paul said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. As they sought to change the glory of the incorruptible God. And they began to worship the creation more than the creator. You see when you start to look at the things. And not look at who has supplied the things. You're one of them fools that Paul is referring to. Now here is a reference to knowing God. In a personal and intimate way. You look to God daily. That's knowing God. You look to God for comfort and for advice and for strength. And you make him your closest friend and confidant. Because when you know him like that, you develop strength. Remember what it says. Remember what the text says. That when you know God, it will make you strong. I'm paraphrasing it there. The most powerful dynamic in knowing God is that you shall be strong. That's the most powerful dynamic you can ever have. Because partnership with God does not produce wimps. Paul said, be strong in the Lord. In what? In what? In what? In the Lord. And in the power of what? In the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. What does it mean? It means you can't be strong by yourself. You might be strong. You might be able to lift a barbell or dumbbell. But in the power of His might, it means that you can speak those things that are not as though they were. It means you can speak unto the mountain and say, Be thou removed in the name of Jesus Christ. It means that our strength is in Him. Our power comes from Him. Paul was praying for his own infirmity. And he spoke to the Lord and, he, and, and, and the Lord declared to him. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength will be perfected in your weakness. Watch this now, watch this now. God's strength will be perfected in your weakness. God's strength uh, will be perfected in your weakness. Uh, no, because you fall, uh, it doesn't mean that you aren't worthy. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It's just the opportunity that God has seized upon uh, while you're falling uh, to be able to pick you up, uh, turn you around, and plant your feet on solid ground so that you can look up to heaven and say, Thank you, Lord. Uh, all glory and all honor belongs 
belongs to you. God is, is, is perfected in you, in your weakness. Hmm. Your mind, a person's mind, determines the person you are. Your mind projects the person that you are. You can be physically fit and be a spiritual wimp, i.e. Goliath, nine feet tall giant who defied the God of Israel and he fell before a youth of small stature in the person of David who was not of his comparative physical attributes. But the thing about David is he knew the God of Israel. The thing about David is what David brought to the battle was not a big shield, none, wasn't a big sword. David didn't bring to the battle an army. David brought his God. What was in his mind? What told him he is greater? What told him he is more than the conqueror? What David brought to the battle was simply the mind of God in which he had sunk himself, believing that if God be for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. He believed that with God, all things are possible. He looked at the giant uh, with some little stones and a slingshot. And he looked at a giant, nine feet tall, a big old shield, uh, a big old spear, a sword. And he laughed at David. And David looked at him. And he looked at him through the eyes of God and in his faith. Uh, and he began to think, you are going down uh, because I know somebody. When Antiochus came to power in 175 BC, he forbade Jewish religious practices. He forbade the Jewish people to have a religious practice. I wonder if you're catching something here. I wonder if anybody really rolling with me this morning. Maybe you need to play this message back a little later and really sink into it. Because uh, it seems as though the body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, is being forbidden to have uh, their religious practices, to declare their God, uh, to stand up, uh, to call on God, uh, to let me make public declarations uh, that the word of God uh, is what I work by, uh, and I have a right to believe, uh, and I have a right to speak, uh, and I have a right to carry my Bible, and I have a right to go to church, uh, and I have a right to sing my song, uh, and I have a right to be delivered, and I have a right to heaven. But it seems that Antiochus is ob obstructing us by fighting all these battles around us, and we are caught in the quagmire, and the church, because they don't want to get caught in the crowd, and they don't want to get involved, the church remains silent. 1 only has to reference Hebrews 11 to understand the great exploits of those who knew God. For a quick reference, Gideon with 300 men destroyed over 135,000 Midianites. Barak with the help of Deborah, defeated the forces of Caesarea with many iron chariots and many modernized weapons in those days. Samson, with a jawbone of a donkey, destroyed a thousand Philip, Philistines. The Bible declares in the book of Hebrews 11 chapter, out of weaknesses they were made strong and became valiant in battle. Out of the weaknesses that everybody saw them as, uh, that they were looking like, uh, in the face of the opposition, they became strong and became valiant. See, don't let yourself be looked at as your figure, your shape, your size, your education, 
you color your skin but let yourself be looked as as a man of God or a woman of God and you are you are hear me this morning you are the most powerful force that there is. I'm prophetically speaking to you this morning according to the word of God. If you know God, you will be made strong. Beloved, it's in the moments of your greatest weakness that if you are dependent on the Lord through faith, that you can become the strongest because that's when God's power is displayed in you. Let me holler at you a little bit here, and I'm going to close like this. I am reminded of a fire drill. And I had occasion to speak with someone who was training to be a firefighter. I remember this person telling me about some of the simulated courses which they must pass before they get the job. And among the many difficult courses and obstacles and challenges that they had to do and train for to perform the job, the core responsibility that they carried every day was to save lives. You see, it's not just about putting out the fire. The central objective would be saving lives. So in other words, when they get a call of a fire, before they ask the size of the fire, the location of the fire, what's, what, what, you know, what's going on with the fire, they are trying to assess are there people in jeopardy? Are there lives in jeopardy? So that's the core value to the firefighting mode or, or model is to save lives. Uh, I remember one of the conversations we were referencing is simulated fire. And, 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 and it was explaining that what they do is they would literally set a building on fire, real fire, and the trainees would practice putting them out using their strategic methods and skills. Uh, they would use the fire, the real fire around the building, and they would bring them in with all the, all the equipment and all the necessary things to put out the fire. But what stood out for me when, he, when, when my brother was explaining me this was the fact that it was a practice fire. Although the fire was real, it was not designed to harm them. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you feeling this? <laughs> the fire was real, but the fire was not designed to harm them because it was simulated to train them and make them able to succeed. The, the whole purpose of the fire was that they can train so that they had an opportunity to succeed. My God, are you getting this? <laughs> so, uh, so somebody needs to get it right here. So sometimes your fire is your training ground that God puts you through in order to succeed. Sometimes you got to go through some fires in your life so that God can prepare you for success. My God, are you getting it? When you know God, and I emphasize know God, even though the fire or the storms may come your way, God will protect you and deliver you from it. You see, just like like my friend, the many are the instructions which the world can give us, which the fire department will give them, which the code and the, and, 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 and the possible training uh, elements will give them. But sometimes, um, while these were made to give them protection, you may learn that the fire in real is a whole different ball game. I have learned through many different teachings and, and information that when there's a fire, one should get low to the floor. Or another term that was used in basic fire uh, uh, training was you tuck and roll in the fire. But I've wondered what happens if there's a fire and you are caught at the top of a staircase and there's fire in the hallway behind you and fire at the front door in front of you, how do you tuck and roll? 
where do you tuck and roll? You may have heard sometimes that in the fire, a very good uh, 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 strategy would be to wet a blanket and put it over you, hold it to your face so you can breathe, or put it over you if in case it, uh, uh, you got to run out a building and it's on flames and you can't get to the door because the whole door is on fire. If you throw the wet blanket over you, and I'm not a professional here, so don't, don't quote me on it. I'm just telling you what I heard. You throw a wet blanket over you and you run out the door and it's supposed to at least cover you to the point where you can get to some help. But what happens? If you're in a building and the roof is on fire and it's about to cave in, what happens if there's no time for you to get to a sink, find a towel and wet it or a blanket to run out the door? You see, indulge me for a minute because I want to shift off of that. I was giving you the natural. I want to take you through some fires that are not flames. I want to take you through some fires that don't burn your flesh. I'm talking about those fires and those floods which burn down your spirit. You see, natural death will take you out of physical pain and suffering. But spiritual death comes from a combination of mental, emotional, and physical afflictions. When you get to the point where you're spiritually dying, it's because physically you can't make it, mentally you messed up, uh, emotionally you can't take it, the afflictions all around you is breaking you down and burning you down, unless... You know God. Because when you know God, He will strengthen you. He'll make you strong. And you'll get out of your spiritual afflictions. Oh my God, help me. I'm close it here. I'm close it here. Because this may not be for everybody, but it's for somebody right here. This is what somebody God told you. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? When your options have been exhausted. What do you do? What do you do? When your ex some time has ran out uh, or the last of your money has just been spent what do you do when the light switch uh, doesn't cancel out the darkness when you flip on the light uh, and there's no electricity in your joint uh, what do you do when the light switch can't cancel out the darkness uh, what do you do when your car is repossessed uh, and you got to go figure out how to get a train or bus uh, what do you do when there's a foreclosure served uh, a, 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 a being a foreclosure notice is served upon you or you come home one day and you find an eviction notice on your door what do you do then who do you call is your friend gonna be able to help you some wanted to make it real I wanted to make it real for some people right here so sometimes when you're down and you're out and sometimes when you're broken oh we seek out God to work for us to restore us to rebuild us to rescue us out of our this fear. We desire to return to a better position in life. Uh, but everyone you know, your family, your loved one, your friends, uh, the neighbors, the pastor, the church members, uh, they're all unable to help you to physically come to your aid. Uh, and their spiritual counsel may be one day too late. Uh, but hold up, hold up, hold up. I got something for you. I got something for you. I know somebody. Uh, I know somebody who can help you. His name is Jesus. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know somebody. He is a sanctuary for the poor. A provider for the needy in distress. Uh, he's a shelter in the storm. Uh, and a shade from the heat. My God, I know somebody. He's the light of the world. Uh, he's the anointed one. Uh, he is the good shepherd. Uh, the the Bible calls him the bread of life. I know somebody. He is a healer and a forgiver. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. He has the ability to bring down the kingdom of heaven to represent you. You may feel broken, weakened, or helpless. But if you know somebody, whose name is Jesus of Nazareth. If you know somebody who is the son of David, the man of sorrows, if you know somebody who is sinless and holy, who is the prince of peace, he'll turn your mourning into dancing again. And this somebody I know, 
The Bible says uh, he has chosen uh, the foolish things of the world to put to shame uh, the wise. Uh, and he has chosen the weak things uh, of the world to put to shame uh, the things that are mighty. Uh, the Bible calls it, and he says, uh, and the base things of the world uh, and the things which are despised. Uh, he has chosen them uh, and the things which are not uh, to bring to nothing the things that are. So when you think you ain't nothing, I came by to tell you, if you know who I know, uh, you are somebody. Uh, if you know what I know, uh, in whom I trust, uh, you are more than the conqueror. If you know God uh, like I know him, uh, you can turn your mourning into dancing again. Because God ain't going to let no flesh glory in his presence. Here is the three takeaways. The fruition of detailed prophecy is the proof that God is sovereign. Secondly, God has not neglected his chosen people. Despite what anybody told you, I, Pastor Gerald LeBlanc, the servant of the Lord, has stopped by to tell you this morning, God has not neglected you, and you are his chosen people. Your plan is still in place, providing you get to know the planner, providing you get to know he who has orchestrated, blueprint, and set the plan in place for you. Finally, God will use the persecution to benefit his people. Every time you think you're being persecuted, God will turn it around for your good. Even though no one wishes to endure Oppression. Nobody goes out. I'm not telling nobody to go out and say, let me have some persecution today. No, 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 no. That's ignorant. That's really ignorant. But God has a greater purpose for you. Every time persecution comes upon you, God has a greater purpose for you as you really get to know his son, Jesus Christ. Beloved, bow your heads right where you are. Heavenly Father, I thank you right now. I thank you for your word, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Father, I receive your word. And I ask those that are at this point in the message, if you don't know the Lord this morning, now is a good time to know him. If you've been up through the grinder, if you've been up tossed to and fro, if you've been... Like the ship in the storm. Now is a good time to know Jesus. Good time to know him as your Lord and Savior. Because he will save you. In the fire. And in the floods. Say with me. Lord Jesus. I receive you into my life. Come on in. Come on in. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me whole. In the name of Jesus. I renounce everything that is not of you this morning, Lord. I cancel it out of my spirit. I speak the love, the compassion, the mercy, the favor, and the grace of God to overcome me right now in Jesus' name. If you mean that with all your heart, now here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to partner up yourself with people of like manner. Get with some people who know God. Get with some, some family or somebody that know God. Your friend, your neighbor. Love you. Just to partner up with them so that they can keep you from falling back into that place where you came from. Find yourself a good Bible teaching church. If you don't have one, you can't get to one, keep tuning into this live stream. We'll continue to have you as our adopted members on time. Find yourself where the word of God begins to speak to you. Don't just wait on Sunday. Get your Bible, begin to read. Before you read, begin to pray and ask God to open your eyes, open your mind, open your spirit, open your heart to understand what you read. 
And God's going to begin to work with you because not only does God say, I want you to know me, God wants to know you. He knows all about you, trust me. He knows you. But until you accept him to know him, you're standing on the outside. God wants to bring you on the inside. He don't want you standing outside watching at the concert. He wants you backstage with him. He wants you at the table with him. He don't want you waiting on the side table where other people are just sitting. He wants you at the head table. You're not just a guest. You're a member when you become one with God. And to those of you who already know the Lord, I'm just in reinforcing in your spirit what God is saying to you. And I know you've been there. You've faced some battles. You've gone up and down. You've, you, 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 you've taken some hits. You've punched back. But God says, don't let the guilt of your past limit the prosperity of your future. So with that in mind, open up your hearts and your minds to release the things that are holding you back and to accept the things that God wants to put in you. In Jesus' name. Beloved, I thank you for your time. I thank you for uh, the opportunity to share your day with you. I pray that even if you didn't get all this message, and I, this is not all of it, but, 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 but the, the depth of this thing is so deep that I tried to summarize it. I pray that the Lord has used me enough to bless your heart and to educate you. And to in, uh, but go back and read the text. Go back and read some of it. And I tell you of a truth. We are seeing Daniel 11 play out right before our very eyes it takes the revelation the relevance and the reality of god ministering into your spirit so that you can see it everything that i talk to you about here is factual and it's happening and god wants to make sure you are not the israel caught between the war of egypt and syria thank you so much for your time i love you with all my heart, with the love of Jesus, I only want you to be blessed and to live your best life ever. Like and share this message, would you? I believe it's a blessing. It will tremendously bless many people on this week if you would be able to be a virtual evangelistic, uh, 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 evangelist with me. Do your, do your virtual evangelism to this week and share the message so somebody could be blessed. God bless you. I love you with the love of Jesus. And until next week, remember, already decreed and declared, you're blessed.